Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Temple Institute Parsha class. My name is Gedalia Meyer, and I'm podcasting from Maladumim in Israel. As I write this podcast, the Israeli-Hamas war is about to enter into its second week. As of now, around 1,500 Israelis have been killed, and another 150 or so hostages have been taken to Gaza with their fate completely uncertain. On the Gaza side, about 1,500 terrorists have been killed within Israel, and an untold number of terrorists and civilians have been killed within Gaza. These numbers are sure to rise in the next few weeks as Israel unleashes its promised ground invasion into Gaza. The civilian death toll in Gaza in particular will inevitably rise dramatically in Gaza. Nobody knows what will happen or on other possible fronts of the war, particularly on the northern border and within the West Bank areas. Where I am, things are relatively calm, believe it or not. This is the bizarre situation of Israel. It could be peaceful and pleasant in one place, and missiles are flying overhead several miles away. A group of people can be celebrating some significant event while checking their phones for the situation of relatives or friends in a war zone. Those in the calm situations look for something to do to help out. For better or worse, there is no shortage of opportunities. The general mode here passes from cautiously hopeful to silently fearful in the blink of an eye. Everywhere one turns in Israel, one hears about a funeral. Almost all of the deaths happened on the first day of the war, but the number keeps going up because more bodies keep being discovered and identified. There seems to be no end to the death count. The military seems to be in control of the situation after taking about a day to fully get into gear. Israeli confidence in the army, after taking a tremendous hit in the first 24 hours, is now fully restored. The world, by and large, is on Israel's side, but that can and will change with the direction the war takes. It's a bit strange writing this now. I normally write on Thursday mornings, but owing to a surgery this coming week, I'm writing on the previous Friday. I write as if it is already the normal time, meaning in the future. There are times when the future seems to be written in stone, when the inevitable is truly inevitable. This, for some strange reason, appears to me to be one of them. Although most of what is being written about the upcoming events of this war suggests great doubt as to the ultimate outcome, there is another angle to everything that makes it almost seem as though it has already happened. I am not going to write my predictions as to the outcome, both out of fear of being proven wrong and out of an odd sense that the future should be left in the future. I will state the obvious, that the war will get bigger before it gets smaller. This much is all but written in the history books. There is a very famous and dramatic Jewish prayer that is recited on Rosh Hashanah that expresses the idea that even individual fates are written in the books at the beginning of the year. How that applies to the situation now is anybody's guess. That fine of a level of destiny is in the hands of God, but on a larger scale, The upcoming fate of a nation or a region seems to be more in the hands of those who move and shake things in the area. Is it God or is it human initiative that makes things of this nature seem so fateful? Nobody really knows. We have a great intellectual abhorrence of the whole idea of fate. But at the same time, we sense and secretly dread its inevitability. If one focuses on the God side of things, it is easy to understand how everything is fixed in some sort of destiny. If one focuses on the human side, it seems like things should be more up in the air. But we all know that the exact opposite frequently seems to be the case. Perhaps it is best to leave questions like these up to fate. In a way, the situation now resembles that of biblical conditions immediately before the flood. This week's Parsha is Noah, the Parsha of the Flood. The entire flood story is contained in this Parsha, and there are a surprisingly small amount of references to it elsewhere in the entire Bible. It is a fairly long Parsha with pretty much everything there is to know about it written in the biblical style. Huge events such as the flood itself take up the same number of verses as minor details. It is not easy to get used to this mode of writing. One expects death counts and vivid descriptions of entire populations drowning. Instead, we don't even really have a firm idea of the region in which the flood started, and there are no accounts of any submerged cities. But there is a lot about Noah sending out a raven and a dove from the ark to see if the floodwaters had abated. The story actually begins in the previous Parsha with the first ominous private declaration by Hashem. This was not a prophetic message to anybody. It was simply the divine decree being expressed 
that all humanity and certain animals would be destroyed somehow. There is no mention that it would be through a flood. The decree has a tone of finality to it. This was not a threat because there was nobody listening. With the beginning of this week's Parsha, we first hear about the flood. It is written with the typical biblical tenor of destiny. This flood is going to happen. The truth is that things like floods are predictable in theory. For God, it should be no tougher than knowing the upcoming weather. But knowing that all human life in the area will be destroyed it is, a, is another matter altogether. This is fate in spades. There is a curious back and forth in the verses leading up to the flood. One series of verses will describe the events that will take place or the instructions to Noah using the divine name Elohim, which is followed by a similar series using the divine name Hashem. The distinction between these names is usually ignored, even among the Jewish commentaries, but it is very evident to those who recognize such things and try to understand why. These are two different ways of describing God, of which Elohim is usually translated as God, while Hashem is the actual biblical Hebrew name for God. In fact, this word Hashem means the name. Why this back and forth with these somewhat repetitive verses is there is a bit of a mystery. First, it is Hashem privately regretting the evils of individual beings and the intention to destroy them. Next is Elohim observing the corrupt state of all flesh. Then Elohim tells Noah to build an ark and declares to him the divine plan of a flood which will destroy all life. Noah is told to bring a male and female of each species into the ark to preserve the precious remnants of life. This is then repeated by Hashem with the additional detail of bringing seven pairs of what would become the kosher animals and birds. These instructions are carried out and the antediluvian world closes with the only verse that contains both divine names of God. In this verse, we are told that everything happened as per the instructions of Elohim and that Hashem sealed Noah into the ark. The rest of this chapter is the flood itself with no mention of God. The next chapter is the aftermath of the flood and Noah's emergence from the ark. Most of this is attributed to the divine name Elohim. The single exception is a few verses in which Noah brings an offering to Hashem. This induces the response in Hashem to appreciate Noah's efforts and to privately declare that, quote, I will never again curse the ground because of people, for the inclination of the individual human being is evil from youth. So I will never again strike all life as I have done. The rest of the days of the world shall be unceasing times of sowing and reaping, cold and hot, summer and winter, day and night. Perhaps there is a profound reason for this back and forth between these two divine images. Perhaps we can suggest that the image of Elohim is that of God manifested in the classic global form of fate. Elohim addresses matters that concern all of life, both regarding its destruction and its preservation. Elohim promises things on a universal scale, the flood itself and the abating of the waters. Right after the promise of Hashem to never curse the world again, Elohim blesses Noah and his family and establishes a kind of a hierarchy to the world, with human beings at the pinnacle having control over the animals. But this includes a declaration of human responsibility towards each other and towards the animals. The needless spilling of blood will be a cardinal sin which will be subject to the retributive forces of fate. Following this, Elohim reveals that the rainbow is to be seen as a sign of a universal covenant between God and all life. Hashem, on the other hand, is manifested on a personal level. This divine interaction is perhaps best described not as universal fate, but as individual destiny. It is Hashem who focuses on the evil of individual human beings and dis destines them for destruction. It is Hashem who somehow seals Noah in the ark, thus sealing the fate of his family as the sole survivors of the flood. It is Hashem who recognizes in Noah's offering the fateful nature of the human personality and how its propensities are embedded in the mind from childhood. It is Hashem who declares that human beings must be left alone to decide their own fate, working to survive and struggling through the climate, the seasons, and the days and the nights. These are two different images of the power of destiny. The first, under the guidance of Elohim, is absolute and final. Under this force, there is little input allowed from human beings. They are left only with the choice of submitting to the universal fate and doing whatever it takes to accept it. 
there are rules to live by and subtle reassurances that things will work out if those rules are followed. This form of fate is truly set in stone. It could be written in the books long before it ever happens. The second form, under the guidance of the divine name Hashem, is destiny on a much more personal level. Individual human beings play a direct role in how this force plays out. We have the power to influence our own personal fate in ways that sometimes seem very normal and expected, and at others seem downright astounding, even to those who have some of the cards in their hands. This form is only set in stone if we allow it to be. Sometimes it is best to let our individual destinies play out, like we are actors in a play that already has its script written. But at others... We are meant to be in the driver's seat, steering things in our own lives in ways that change our fate from good to bad or bad to good. It is at times such as these when a simple act such as a personal offering can alter our destiny and allow Hashem to see us as we really are, struggling all our lives with our passions, but nevertheless, never fully losing our divine image of God. Shabbat Shalom.